Good afternoon. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this special presentation of the Reverend Joseph Carrier CSC Science Medal, the most prestigious award given by the College of Science. I am Santiago Schnell, the William K. Warren Foundation Dean of the College of Science. We are pleased to host this second annual event conferring the Reverend Carrier Medal to a highly accomplished international scientist. To begin today's program, I would like to share a bit about the award namesake. The Reverend Carrier Medal is named after Notre Dame first champion of science, Father Joseph Celestine Bastille Carrier. The youngest of 10 children from a wealthy French family, he attended the College of Belle, uh, now called De La Cille in Paris, France. While there, he excelled in science and mathematics. Before joining the Congregation of the Holy Cross, he taught natural science, which was the early name for the field of physics in Geneva, Switzerland. When he arrived first to the United States, it was during the height of the Civil War. Father Soring asked him to be ready to serve immediately as an army, ch army chaplain, leading him to work in the 6th Missouri Infantry Regiment for Ulysses Grand Army of the Republic. When Father Kerry arrived at Notre Dame, Father Soder, Soring asked him to head the science program, a six-year program that includes two years of preparatory a school and four years of college. And that began in the year 1865. Father Carrier organized courses in botany and established two botanical gardens in campus. He also started what is now known the Notre Dame Museum of Biodiversity, now located in the Galleria in Jordan Hall of Science. It is an honor to celebrate Father Carrier, as well as the Congregation of the Holy Cross today because without them, we wouldn't have the opportunity to award this medal to such esteemed and deserving scientists. The College of Science awards the Carrier Medal to a scientist who have revolutionized our understanding of a particular topic. We identify these scientists by looking for groundbreaking studies that have incorporated into textbooks, enriching the knowledge in part to students. As a result, these scientists change the way we teach by introducing new perspectives, ideas, or facts. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. John McGreevitt, historian and the Charles Gill Fisher Provost of the University of Notre Dame, who will present a bit about the medal itself and the award to our 2023 recipient. Thank you, Dean Schnell. As provost of the University of Notre Dame, I am delighted to present the second annual Carrier Medal. Dean Schnell mentioned Father Carrier's many contributions to science at Notre Dame, but above all, his service to the Congregation of Holy Cross. Like the priests and brothers who came before him and have come after him, Father Carrier not only tended to the intellectual needs of the community at Notre Dame, but its spiritual needs. This is what makes Notre Dame a special place, and we are grateful for our Catholic tradition and the way it informs all that we do. And now, to the primary reason for our celebration today. The Reverend Carrier Medal is the most prestigious award given by the College of Science. It represents the pinnacle of scientific excellence achieved during years of a career dedicated to discerning the answers the universe has to offer. Science is not static, nor are its answers. There are failures in obtaining expected outcomes. We non-scientists may remember these as incorrect hypotheses, end quote. But these still may lead to world-changing discoveries. There are also successes, refined, adjusted, and tested many times over. Today, our winner of the Reverend Carrier Medal has proven how life-changing some discoveries can be. We award the medal this year to Thomas Sudhoff, a scientist whose research led him to be awarded the 2013 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for the discovery of the machine regulating vesicle traffic, which is the major transport system in our cells. The cells inside our body create many different molecules that are sent to specific sites. As these are moved around, many of these molecules are grouped in tiny sac-like structures called vesicles. 
The vesicles not only move substances to different areas inside the cell, but they also send molecules from the surface of cells to other parts of the body. Dr. Sudhoff's lab studied brain cells from mouse models and discovered how the vesicles are held in place, ready to release molecules at the right time. He shared the Nobel Prize in 2013 with James E. Rothman and Randy W. Schenkman. Dr. Sudhoff is originally from Göttingen, Germany, and is the Avram Goldstein Professor Investigator at Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Stanford. He holds appointments as professor in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Physiology and of Neurosurgery, and professor in the Department of Neurology, Neurological Sciences, and Psychiatry and, Psychiatry and Behavioral Science. He earned his MD and PhD degree from the University of Göttingen and performed his doctoral thesis work at the Max Planck Institute. He also trained as a postdoctoral fellow with Michael Brown and Joseph Goldstein at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, both of whom were also awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1985. Their work described the structure, expression, and cholesterol-dependent regulation of the LDL receptor gene, a project to which Dr. Sudhoff contributed. His current research, research he'll discuss today, focuses on the study of synapses and their central but as yet incompletely understood role in brain function. What a remarkable research career on multiple topics. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Dr. Sudhoff has also received several other awards, including the Albert Lasker Basic Medical Research Award. He is a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the Royal Society of London, and the European Science Academy. It is now time to call Dr. Sudhoff forward, and Dean Schnell will award him our Carrier Medal. Let's give him an initial round of applause. <laughs> Dr. Sudhoff, on behalf of the University of Notre Dame and the College of Science, it is my great pleasure to award the 2023 Reverend Carrier Medal to you of the Stanford University School of Medicine. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, at, it's a real and true honor for me to stand here before you today to be awarded this wonderful medal named after a truly inspirational character, person, contributor to this university. This is my first time at Notre Dame University, and I have to tell you that I am truly impressed. I've had a wonderful time with the students and the faculty. I think this place has a vibrant, atmosphere, an intellectually curious environment that bodes well for the education and for the research that's being done here. You know, I've seen many places throughout the world. It is always for me the greatest pleasure to talk to the people wherever I visit the students, the faculty, the staff, and it's been a particularly enjoyable time for me here. And so I would like to not only thank Dean Schnell and the provost for this wonderful uh, award, but also all of you for welcoming me here and for allowing me to learn more about the university, which has really been uh, very enjoyable, so thank you. What I would like to do today is not tell you about the work that led to my Nobel Prize or to my scientific journey. 
I also would like to not tell you today about some of the more um, esoteric parts of our work. Instead, I want to tell you about some of the science we are doing on a subject that I'm personally very much interested in. And that is uh, an outcome, if you want, of some of the other work we are doing. I will tell you today about our work on the cell biology of Alzheimer's disease. And this is very much a project under construction, in progress. As I will explain to you, I don't think we have an answer. I don't think we know what's going on. But I think there's reason for optimism and reason to think that we are going to learn a lot. The human brain is an amazing organ. It is truly magical in many ways because of its enormous capabilities in all dimensions. It is so amazing also because, although it looks big, because it's enormously complex, the abilities that the human brain has, the kinds of calculations of memories, of thoughts, of feelings, of actions, are incredible. And it does this via progress processing information that comes in via sensory inputs and transforming them in the end to some kind of output, possibly the most important of which is language. We don't understand the human brain. Let's just put it this way. And I'm not sure we're going to understand in my lifetime. Actually, I'm sure we won't. Um, <laughs> and I'm not sure we're going to understand it in my children's lifetime. So its complexity is just illustrated by the fact that if you compare it to the human genome, a human brain is much more complex, as illustrated here with 10 to the 12 neurons that are connected by thousands and thousands of synapses. A hu human genome looks tr it's trivially simple. Nevertheless, we don't understand the human genome either. So there's work to be done. What I want to do today is tell you first about some conceptual thoughts illustrated with some science focusing on Alzheimer's disease. It basically lists, introduces the subject and discusses where we are. I then want to tell you about one project briefly that I'm going to tell you about because I think it illuminates what I call the cell biology of Alzheimer's disease and where we are. And finally, I'll spend one slide on puzzles and potential solutions. Alzheimer's disease is named after Alois Alzheimer, a German physician. What you see here is a photograph of his first patient, Auguste Deta, who suffered from a familiar form of Alzheimer's disease and succumbed to it rapidly. When Alois Alzheimer first observed, categorized, described this disease that now carries his name, he was impressed by the symptoms. What happens is that over time, chronically, over years, patients first lose their memory. It starts with short-term memory loss and then progresses towards an inexorably progressive loss of all brain functions. As you all know, Memories are really among the most important possessions we have as people, as individuals. We are the sum of our memories, of our experiences, of what we have learned throughout our lives. And as such, losing our memories is the worst thing that can happen to a person, especially since many Alzheimer's disease patients notice it, they feel it. It is a truly devastating disease. It is also a frequent disease. What you see here is an incidence of the disease in men and women as a function of age. Just the total incidence. Among Americans above the age of 65, 11% have the disease, but 
as you grow older, your chances of coming down with Alzheimer's disease increase dramatically, such that if you are lucky enough to reach the age of 90, 95, your chance of Alzheimer's disease approaches 50%. Think about it. This is not trivial. All the advantages we have gained by better medical care, better nutrition, better lifestyles may be wiped out because there's a disease that affects a large number of people which makes you lose your mind. Women have a slightly larger incidence than men, but because women on average live much longer than men, the number of female Alzheimer's disease patients is much bigger. There is no protection here. What happens in Alzheimer's disease is basically that neurons die, the nerve cells. The cells that are central to information processing by the brain and that are assisted, as you all know, by other types of cells, astrocytes, microglia, oligodendrocytes, OPCs. Nobody knows why exactly these cells die, but what happens then is that the brain shrinks, the ventricles enlarge. This is the physical correlate of the loss of the mind in these patients. Microscopically, what Alzheimer already described, and which is still classical for Alzheimer's disease, are three features. One is the presence of so-called neurofibrillary tangles that are inside the nerve cells and are composed of a protein called tau. The other one are the extracellular plaques, amyloid plaques, that are composed of another protein called a beta that I'll talk about a bit. And the third feature not illustrated here is an inflammatory reaction with activated microglia. And these three features were already described by Alzheimer, by Alice Alzheimer himself, and they continue to be the key features. What's interesting is that amyloid plaques composed of a beta accumulate in the brain long before there's any symptoms, decades. They've been shown to be present already in many people in their 20s when they're perfectly normal cognitively. They accumulate more and more. And because of this accumulation, these plaques have long been a center of attention in the research on, of Alzheimer's disease. What also happens is that as the patients begin to show symptoms, as shown here in a slide taken from a work on the neuropathological changes analyzed by electron microscopy in Alzheimer's disease patients. As the patients start to have symptoms and MCI, mild cognitive impairments, which is early Alzheimer's disease, there is already a loss of synapses that becomes dramatic in symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, and that precedes precedes the loss of neurons and the shrinking of the brain. So these are the features of Alzheimer's disease. And because of the enormous importance of the disease, significant effort has been made to try to understand it. In my view, the best evidence, the most interesting results have come from human genetics which have shown that there are genes in which variations or mutations are predisposed to Alzheimer's disease. There's two principal forms of Alzheimer's disease. There's familial forms of Alzheimer's disease that are rare and that are caused by gene mutations, which always cause the disease, 100% of the cases. These familiar forms are caused by mutations in three genes two different presenilins and one APP gene that I'll discuss a bit later. On the other end of the spectrum, there's a large number of genes now, more than 100, where small variations are common in the population and predisposed to Alzheimer's disease with a tiny effect size. And finally, possibly for most importantly, there's this middle region these are genes in which variations predispose to Alzheimer's disease with a much larger effect size that are also more common than familiar Alzheimer's disease, especially ApoE4. In fact, ApoE4, an apolipoprotein that transports cholesterol in the blood, 
is probably the most important genetic risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's disease. This is what the genetic landscape looks like, a common theme emerging for many of the genetic hits in our Alzheimer's disease is a beta, this protein that is part of these plaques that accumulate already early on, long before patients become manifestly sick from Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that all three genes that are involved in causing familial Alzheimer's disease, presenilins and APP, are actually involved in the production of ABDA, suggesting a pathway, a pathogenetic pathway for the disease. Let me illustrate this to you. What you see here is schematically, taken from Wikipedia, the source of our wisdom, as I'm sure you know, um, is an illustration of APP. APP is a cell surface protein that is expressed in many cells, but particularly abundant in neurons. What happens is that this protein on the cell surface, when it is mutated, causes Alzheimer's disease. And what happens with this protein on the cell surface is that it is cleaved by proteases into pieces. There's first a cleavage, a cut outside. <clears throat> that cut releases a part of the protein that's floating away and leaves a little stub left over on the surface. There's then a second cleavage by an enzyme called gamma secretase. This gamma secretase enzyme causes a cut in the middle of the membrane and as a result liberates the A beta peptide, this little piece between the first cut and the second cut. The genes whose mutations cause Alzheimer's disease, familiar Alzheimer's disease, are either the APP gene or the presenilin genes that are part of the protease, the gamma secretase protease that cuts, makes the second cut. And thereby, they are connected. And this is what releases the A-beta peptide, which then aggregates in the extracellular space in these plaques. Because of this pathway, a model emerged whereby APP cleavage produces a beta that aggregates and that that somehow then causes neuronal cell death and inflammation. That is the common model of how people think about Alzheimer's disease. And not surprisingly, because of this model, drug companies have focused on developing pharmaceutical agents that might interfere with this production of a beta or that might clear the plaques. And some of these therapies most recently show promise. They have an undeniable benefit. As you probably heard, the ABDA antibody from Biogen has been approved by the FDA. What you see here is from taken from the paper, from the research paper that describes the clinical trial that formed the basis for the approval. And you can see here on the left that this antibody, when administered to patients, is incredibly effective. What it does is basically it takes away all the plaques in the brain. It's amazing. It takes, you know, that after 12 to 18 months, which is the time of the trial, the brain is basically cleared of these plaques. And this is a true success. This drug is working. It's actually surprising to me how an antibody that is given to the blood, 0.1% maybe gets into the CSF, how effective that is within a year to get rid of all this crap. Sorry to talk about this, okay? But what you see here on the right is the clinical benefit. That's the basis for the approval. That's one of the several clinical scores that were used to assess the patients. And you can see clearly that the drug does slow down the decline. It works. But... What I find disappointing is that despite clearing the entire brain of a beta plaques, it only slows down progression. It doesn't actually stop progression. So progression goes on, even though the plaques are still there, even though the plaques are no longer there, sorry. The plaques are gone, 
progression still goes on. In fact, the clinical benefit is 27% decline in progression. It's not, you know, it doesn't halt the disease. It's not a massive effect. This decrease or the lack of clinical efficacy beyond the small benefit is not due to the length of treatment because even at the end of the treatment, when there were no more plaques, the rate of progression doesn't really slow down. It still progresses. So this, in some ways, doesn't really work that well. Why doesn't it work that well? Why is it that despite the fact that there's a loss of plaques, the patients still get worse? One thing you have to know, which is really kind of counterintuitive, is that in Alzheimer's disease, as the plaques accumulate in the brain, the concentration of A beta in the CSF actually goes down. It doesn't go up. In other words, this is a biomarker that is used to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, and it's counterintuitive because if A beta causes the disease, you would expect the abita to go up, but it doesn't. It goes down. And in fact, in these experiments, in these clinical trials, what you can see here is that the CSF biomarkers, abita 42, one of the abitas, goes up with the patients in the CSF. So this correlates as a biomarker with an improvement because it's a decrease that characterizes Alzheimer's disease, but it's a bit counterintuitive because you would expect that if you decrease, if you clear the plaques, you're taking away the abita, you would have also a loss of total abita. No, you don't. The abita goes up, at least for abita 42, although the abita 40 stays the same. What does go down is the CSF tau, both the total tau and the phospho tau which are markers also for the disease because they relate to the fibrillary tangles that I described to you earlier. So what these experiments, if I may call them experiments, what these data from clinical trials demonstrate is that when you have a decrease of plaques, you do get beneficial benefits for the patients, but they're small. And the soluble A beta goes actually up a bit, although the increase, highly statistically significant, is not going back to normal. Okay. And a similar picture emerges from plasma biomarkers, which I'm not going to discuss for reasons of time. It's not really relevant. The bottom line is that the anti A beta antibody works extremely well. It is truly a good drug. It even lowers tau, suggesting that tau is secondary to the abita plaques. But there's only a modest decrease in the rate of progression and an increase of abita instead of a decrease in the CSF. So what I want to do at this point, inspired or prompted by these findings, is tell you about an experiment we performed in our lab that tries to address the question the difficult question of what a beta might mean. And in this experiment, we used a technology that involves making human neurons from stem cells and then analyzing these neurons for their functional properties. And the way we did this in these experiments is that we, we introduced a human mutation that is observed in patients, the so-called Swedish mutation, that causes Alzheimer's disease, familiar Alzheimer's disease, 100% of the time. And we engineered stem cells in which we would have total control of the genetic background by making the mutation conditional. So the way you have to imagine this is that the engineering works as described here. I'm not going to go into the detail. It doesn't really matter. But then after we make the neurons, we can either turn them into normal neurons or into neurons that have a mutation. And that way, we avoid potential interference confounding factors by, let's say, background genetic changes or clonal of propagation or other difficult to control influences on phenotypes. What we then do is 
We make neurons from stem cells by a technology that we developed in collaboration with Marius Wernick many years ago. And that involves fast expression of a transcription factor, NGN2. And that makes, I think, beautiful neurons. So you may disagree. In vitro. And um, these neurons form synapses and enable us to study these synapses as well as other properties of the neurons. When we did this, we found that neurons that either contained or la uh, either contained a APP Swedish mutant that causes Alzheimer's disease or the controls had the same levels of APP protein as you would expect. It's a point mutation, shouldn't change anything, but that there was a dramatic increase in a beta secretion. Oops. That wasn't a surprise. It was well known that the APP Swedish mutation causes an increase in a beta secretion. In fact, many of the APP mutations that cause familial Alzheimer's disease, not all, but many, cause an increase in a beta secretion. So this was not novel, but it confirmed that we're doing the right thing because we are confirming what other people have done before. Um, so then the question was for us in these human neurons under these extremely well-controlled conditions, is there a phenotype? And yes, there was a phenotype and that phenotype was unexpected and is illustrated here, namely an increase in the synaptic connections, not a decrease. So the increased a beta production was associated with more synapses, not less synapses. The effect is modest, but significant. What you see here is four different stem cell derived neurons, neurons from derived from four different lines of stem cells to rep show reproducibility. And in each case, there's an increase in synapses. There's some variation that is probably clonal, suggesting that what this mutation does is not in itself deleterious. It doesn't hurt the neurons, which considering the fact that Alzheimer's disease develops in these patients over decades, is actually quite consistent with the clinical presentation. An increase in neurons was a surprise. An increase in synapses was a surprise. So we wondered whether these synapses were actually functionally. We performed electrophysiology. These are two different clones. These are measurements of spontaneous synaptic events. What you see, again, is a relatively similar, if not the same, increase in the number in the frequency of spontaneous synaptic events, suggesting that the increased synapse numbers translate into increased synaptic communication. And finally, we also measured evoked synaptic transmission again using two different clones. And you can see that there is again a very well correlated increase in synaptic connections as evidenced by an increase in the amplitude of evoked synaptic responses. So counterintuitively, a mutation that causes familial Alzheimer's disease and that increases a beta secretion enhances synaptic function in human neurons. This was, to us, surprising. It's not what we expected. But in some way, it reminded us of the fact that the first set of clinical trials designed to interfere with a beta were actually clinical trials with an N inhibitor, a pharmacological inhibitor of the first protease that cuts APP. So remember, it first cuts outside and then in the middle. And that first protease is called base, base one. And these inhibitors were used in clinical trials. And when they were used in clinical trials, something terrible happened. The patients got worse. They didn't get better. They actually, these inhibitors actually accelerated the cognitive decline. And that was a very, not a, certainly not desired outcome. It was also unexpected. Um, and the interpretation was that maybe base one is involved in other things in the brain and inhibiting is not good for the brain. Well, it certainly is not good for the brain, but it's unclear from these clinical trials why the inhibitors were not successful. Okay. So we put on the inhibitor 
And what we found was when we looked at the number of synapses as shown here, the inhibitor in these gray bars just added to wild type cells causes a suppression of synapse numbers. What you can also see in the red bars is, and this is again with two independent clones, is that when you also have the Swedish mutation present, the inhibitor prevents the effect of the Swedish mutation. So it's Swedish mutation is downstream. The effect of the Swedish mutation is downstream of the base of base, suggesting that the Swedish mutation requires base cleavage. And if you inhibit base with a more pharmacological inhibitor, you get basically a loss of, um, of synapses that you can't um, compensate for by the Swedish mutation. And this is just the size of the synapses. Function correlate, synaptic function correlate, not surprisingly, after all I've what I told you, the base one inhibitor also inhibits synaptic function as shown here in the mini frequency, spontaneous events, synaptic events. Again, it occludes the effect of the Swedish mutation. So APP is upstream of an APP proteolysis product, most likely a beta, that, require, that is a product that requires base one cleavage. This also might suggest a reason why the base one inhibitors in clinical trials failed. What this implies is that APP normally is somehow involved, among others, in shaping synapses in the brain, suggesting that the knockout of APP itself, the total knockout, should actually cause a loss of synapses. And as you can see here, using conditional deletions, that's exactly what happens. You get a loss of synapses when you decrease, when you delete a beta genetically, this is APP genetically. This again is a conditional genetic deletion. You get a loss of spontaneous synaptic events as measured by the MEPSC frequency, and you get a decrease in synaptic connections as measured by evoked synaptic responses monitored electrophysiologically. Consistent with all of these findings thus, in human neurons, deletion of APP produces the mirror image of the APP Swedish mutation. It suggests that the APP Swedish mutation is actually a gain of function mutation that increases synapsistic connectivity in cultured neurons at the time frame of a culture experiment in a petri dish. And that it, um, so these two things are like mirror images of each other. So the question then arises whether this effect is mediated by a beta, which is obviously a key question. This is a very complicated slide. I don't want to go into it in detail because I think it's a bit too specialized. The bottom line here is that if we make a beta in hex cells, which are cultured cancer cells, and then take that a beta that is naturally made in these cells and transfer it, to cultured human neurons, it has a positive effect in that it increases synapse numbers and increases synaptic connectivity. And this effect depends on the, um, on basically, uh, is independent of having APP there. It actually operates with or without APP, as you would expect, if a beta is produced by the a APP. So, the bottom line here, this is, with all these experiments that I discussed now, that a beta is not toxic under physiological conditions. This is clearly an increase of a beta. It's physiological because it's from the endogenous gene. It's not overexpressed. It's not at high concentrations. It causes, if anything, a gain of function. And if anything, it makes the neurons talk to each other more, not less. If you look back at what I told you at the very beginning from the clinical trials, you could thus postulate that the benefit that's observed with the anti-A beta antibodies in patients is not due to a loss of the plaques, but to a reversal of the free A beta that you see in these patients as a result of this treatment. I don't know if that's the case, but there would be an alternative interpretation that has obvious 
therapeutic implications because it would suggest that you would actually, that treating the plaques may be beneficial, but it, uh, it may not be enough. Well, it clearly isn't enough because the patients are getting worse. But it may also be, um, there may be a path forward to go beyond just removing the plaques. So where do we go from here? What I've tried to summarize to you in this part of the talk is that enormous progress has been made in the human genetics. It's actually amazing. Um, there's limited progress in disease mechanisms, and I hope I've convinced you of that. And there's even less progress in therapeutics. I think the patients deserve better than a 27% decrease in progression. We need to do more. We need to do better. And how can we do this? What would an ideal drug look like? We need drugs that are small molecules in order to be economical. We need drugs that are safe, that can be given for decades. In fact, it seems likely that we will need to treat people with who are predisposed to Alzheimer's disease because of their genetics for a long, long period. So these need to be really, really good drugs. And there's actually a precedent for this, a precedent that uh, takes me back to my time as a postdoc. Many, many years ago, it became clear that atherosclerosis is the most important cause of death. It still actually is. But it was a much worse problem 50 years ago than it is now. And it was realized that atherosclerosis depends on high blood cholesterol, among others. And so at that point, the need was clear that what needed to be done is we needed, the community needed to develop drugs that lower blood cholesterol. And this is illustrated in this slide here. The starting point was that increased cholesterol levels were known to cause atherosclerosis and heart disease. But the mechanisms, the pathway to lowering this cholesterol was unclear. And so um, to do this, you couldn't just engineer. So the logical way would be to just engineer a drug. But how do you engineer a drug if you don't know the biology? You had to do the biology first in order to engineer a drug. And this is exactly what Brown and Goldstein did. They, engineer, they basically developed, uh, discovered how cholesterol in blood is regulated, and that formed the basis for the development of statins that now I think millions of people came to take and that were certainly uh, saved, I think, the lives certainly of millions of people worldwide. So um, I finished with the first part of my talk. I will, since the time is getting late, I will give you a glimpse of a totally different project in the second part of my talk. I'm offering this project to you as an illustration as a way to basically tell you a bit about the basic biology of these genes that are involved in Alzheimer's disease and why also why it's so difficult to make progress, why it's so difficult to get to the, some point here where we can actually interfere with the disease. And I'm going to rush over some features because um, I realize we are running a little bit late. Well, it's always like this, right? <laughs> and, and so this project really started 20 years ago when a postdoc in my lab, Chen Zhang, who is now a dean of a medical school in China, um, <coughs> uh, collaborated with another lab at Harvard to investigate the function of presenilins in mice. And so what he did at that time was to inactivate presenilins either in a presynaptic cell or in a postsynaptic cell in the hippocampus separately. And this is illustrated in the top slides. And you can do this with genetic tricks. And then he tested whether either the presynaptic or the postsynaptic deletion of presenilins in mice would cause a change in synaptic function. The question here was, do presenilins have a synaptic function? And the bottom line was that the postsynaptic deletion had no effect on synaptic function, whereas the presynaptic deletion causes a decrease in synaptic transmission that was due to a decrease in release probability. And this mechanism was proven 
using a sophisticated approach called MK801 inhibition that enables you to actually quantify the release probability, as shown here in this slide. So these results suggested that there is a presynaptic role for presenilins after neurons are made. Presenilins and gamma secretase have many other roles, but this is in the mature neurons, and this, this exclusively presynaptic role causes a large decrease in synaptic function. At this, so some years ago, a very talented MD PhD student joined my lab, Sophia SIS, SAN Paris, and um, set out to see what happens in human neurons, because human neurons are different from mouse neurons. You may be surprised to hear. And so um, we wondered whether the same thing would happen in human neurons. And so um, we made human neurons, as I illustrated to you before. In these neurons, we made neurons either that had a deletion of presenilins, or we, stim or we, um, we, we added an inhibitor, pharmacological inhibitor, of gamma secretase. And then we cultured these neurons for a month or so and analyzed them in vitro for their properties. And we wanted to ask here specifically, how does this, does this have any effect? What is the effect on human neurons? How does this possibly relate to Alzheimer's disease? This procedure works because when you do this, you get a decrease in A-beta, you get an increase in the uncleaved APP, and you get also an increase in the uncleaved other proteins, confirming that we now have a toolbox. We have a way of blocking gamma secretase chronically as an approach to testing its biological function in human neurons. We analyzed these neurons. They looked normal in terms of their um, morphology, their normal axons and dendrites. And then we turned to synapses. And when we analyzed synapses, we found that there was a small increase in synapse numbers in human neurons, but a decrease in synaptic function a massive decrease in synaptic function. This decrease in synaptic function, as we showed, was due to a decrease in release probability, just like in mice. So for once, we had an effect that was actually accurately modeled in the mice. Moreover, this effect was required a chronic suppression of gamma secretase inhibition, because if you did it only for 24 hours, there was no significant decrease. You need at least four, 48 hours, at least two days. So this is not an acute effect. It's not like gamma secretase is involved in synaptic transmission. It's a chronic consequence of gamma secretase. I already told you that the release probability was changed. I'm not going to go into this. And the same thing was observed with human neurons that lacked, had genetic mutations in presenilins as observed in patients. So all this great, wonderful, confirms previous studies. We are always happy when we can confirm our own results. Okay, But it doesn't tell us how it works. How does it work? Since 2010, when we initially did these the mouse studies, much has happened in the technology. And among others, RNA-seq has become a standard approach. So not surprisingly, the first thing you, we do nowadays when we want to know how something works is see if there's an RNA-seq, there's any change. Because it's fast, it's easy, and it's usually quite definitive. Mostly negative, actually. And so what this enables us, because the way how we do these experiments is that we can differentiate between the mouse glia that are co-cultured with the human neurons, so we can look at gen changes in gene expression. And when we did this here, we got a very surprising result. It's the most clear-cut result we've ever gotten in RNA-seq experiments, of which we've done a lot. This is the only time, in fact, that I remember where the result was black and white. And it was truly black and white. Because, as you can see here, in the human neurons, chronic gamma secretase inhibition caused an upregulation of cholesterol transport and cholesterol synthesis genes. 
This was not observed in the glia that were also chronically inhibited. So there was a neuron specific upregulation of cholesterol synthesis genes. Amazing effect. All top 20 genes that were upregulated were cholesterol related genes. That is quite surprising to us. We didn't expect that. We thought that you, know, you would get some hints or something, some genes to follow up. This was, as I said, black and white. There were some down-regulated genes that were more heterogeneous, some related to neuronal activity, because after all, the neurons are not as active. So the mouse glia, on the other end, didn't have any. So this was not a universal function of gamma secretase. It was specific for the human neurons. How can we explain this? Now, when you think about the cholesterol synthesis pathway, as illustrated here, it's a very linear pathway. It's beautiful. There were several Nobel Prizes given for this pathway. It must be important. Um, <laughs> and so when you think about this, there's two potential explanations for this change in gene expression. One is. Gamma secretase is known to regulate transcription. And it's known to regulate transcription primarily based on the notch paradigm, because notches requires gamma secretase cleavage in order to regulate transcription during development, a super important pathway that's also involved in cancer. That would be one explanation, that gamma secretase and neurons only, but not in glia, causes an upregulation of all cholesterol synthesis genes via a direct effect that is mediated by some substrate that is cleaved. Another explanation would be that gamma secretase by an equally unknown mechanism causes a decrease in cholesterol in the cell and that the upregulation of cholesterol synthesis is, a col is basically a reaction to that decrease. So one can obviously test this by just measuring cellular cholesterol. We did this in neurons. What you see here is plasma, cholesterol, plasma membrane cholesterol levels. And you can see that chronic gamma secretase inhibition causes a decrease in plasma membrane cholesterol. And the same thing is observed by deletion of presenilin 1 in these human neurons. It causes the same decrease in plasma membrane cholesterol. This is not observed in the mouse glia. And it provides an explanation for why there's an upregulation. It's a consequence of the suppression of the cholesterol. And we also did, uh, proved this by direct measurements of cholesterol, esterophyte and non-esterophyte, and the glia as well as in the neurons, as shown here. So this explains the transcriptome analysis. Does this have a relationship to Alzheimer's disease? I don't know. I can only speculate. I'm a scientist. I love to speculate, right? Um, <laughs> And so the way we think about this is that at least some of the genes that are linked to, cholesterol, to Alzheimer's disease are actually associated with cholesterol metabolism, most prominently ApoE, because ApoE is a, a cholesterol transport apolipoprotein. We actually don't know what ApoE does in the brain because it's produced locally and it may have other functions, but at least in the blood, it is clearly a cholesterol transport gene. And there are other genes that are predisposed to Alzheimer's disease that are also involved in cholesterol transport, such as APCA1. So this is entirely possible that this interconnects, intersects here. But at this point, we really don't actually have evidence that the presenilin function in mature neurons that regulates cholesterol levels, that the fact that you need presenilins and gamma secretase for keeping up normal cholesterol, that this is related to Alzheimer's disease, although it, would, it is, again, as I said, tempting to speculate that it does, because in the human disease that is caused by presenilin mutations, you do get a gamma secretase loss of function. So let me finally come to my last slide. I'm pointing out here two puzzles that I find particularly prominent at this point in trying to understand 
how Alzheimer's disease develops, puzzles that I think we're going to need to address if we want to develop treatments that are more effective than what we currently have available. I am puzzled by what I told you. I like to talk about things that I'm puzzled by, and I hope you share my um, puzzledness, <laughs> if that's the right word, if that word exists. Um, I don't know how a beta in itself could actually increase synaptic connections. There have been lots and lots of nature cell science papers claiming to have discovered a beta receptors. I don't know which ones are true. Can't all be true. Um, I have a difficult imagining that there's a specific receptor, but maybe there is. So this is really um, puzzling me. Um, and um, <clears throat> I don't know how that relates to the activation of microglia and astrocytes that you see in the disease. And that is clearly also important for the disease. Another puzzle that is maybe related to the first puzzle that I find intriguing but overlooked is the fact that even mutations that cause Alzheimer's disease with 100% penetrance always, familial Alzheimer's disease, APP mutations, prisoner mutations, that it takes them 50 years to do so. No, that's a long, long time in a human life. Yeah. And so why does it take so long? So, most genetic diseases, rare or otherwise, develop in a much faster time frame. This is a long time period for a disease to develop. And you wonder, what happened? Why do you need 50 years for the disease to be so, have that enormously deleterious, those tragic effects on the patients? And I don't have a solution to this puzzle, but I think these two might be related because Clearly, whatever the disease process actually is, it can't be an acute toxicity. It has to be something that accumulates, that basically it takes time to become effective, negatively so, in the patient. I think we need to focus on a conceptual understanding of synapse loss and neuronal cell death and Alzheimer's disease, because in the end, that's what causes the symptoms. That's why the patients suffer. That's the final endpoint. That's the final pathway. This could be in part due to a microglial reaction that's inappropriate. It could be due to the, uh, to the loss of free A beta, as I suggested as a possible hypothesis, or it could be due to a combination of things. And then I think we have to accept, and this is an ethically difficult question, that in the end, the only way how we can really gain clarity about any hypothesis is by doing clinical trials and testing what actually works. So in some ways, a clinical trial is an experiment. And it sounds terrible to experiment with people. But I don't see an alternative where if we have a promising hypothesis, we will never know if a drug actually works if we don't compare it with somebody who doesn't get the drug. And so, in other words, I think we do need to always be sensitive to performing clinical trials, obviously performing them using the best standard of care as a comparison, but still, we don't know if something works until we actually test it. Otherwise, we will use a lot of therapies that are not effective. And I'm a little bit concerned that we are already using a lot of therapies that are not effective and that may inspire the wrong impression on patients and convert and in the end disappoint the patients. So I do think that that's a necessity. I would like to end here now and thank the people in my lab in particular for these studies I discussed today. These studies were carried out by Sophia Essayan Paris, who just graduated and is back in medical school. Um, <coughs> Bo Zhu did the original experiment, the ABIDA. Ying Sha Zhang uh, was uh, instrumental in developing the technology with many others in the lab. And Chen did the initial experiments that are in the mice 
more than 10 years ago that I described. Um, and I've had a very wonderful collaboration with Jia Shen at Harvard and with Marius Wernick at Stanford. Happy to discuss anything you would like to talk about. Thank you very much. I'd be happy. Yes, sure. Crystal clear, nobody wants to. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah. Involved. Yes, so this is a great question for those who didn't uh, hear the question. The question is whether or not, you know, how immune, the immune system, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system contributes to Alzheimer's disease. There's no doubt that there's a huge immune component, inflammatory component to the disease. Several genetic hits, although not the major ones, are in microglial genes, especially TREM2. Um, and clearly in the brains you see inflammatory reactions. In the history of Alzheimer's disease research, interestingly, people were first preoccupied with a beta, then they rediscovered the inflammation and everybody worked on microglia like crazy. Yeah, all of a sudden all these labs that worked on a beta worked on microglia and discovered microglia. <laughs> and now most recently with the success or the partial success of the anti beta antibodies, they are I guess shifting back to a beta, I don't know. Um, I think there's no question that the immune system is involved. There's two hypotheses, and I don't know which one is true. One is that the immune system is beneficial and actually counteracts whatever toxic effect there is in Alzheimer's disease that kills the neurons. The idea here is, for example, that microglia, very common idea, very widely shared, uh, gobble up all the albedo, and by gobbling up the albedo, help the brain to be res resilient against the disease. The other alternative is, our explanation is that the immune system is actually deleterious. That the immune system, in a kind of autoimmune reaction, although autoimmune reactions are usually only applied to the adaptive immune system elsewhere in the body, but in a kind of deleterious way, harms the brain by being overactivated and appropriately activated. That is a less popular hypothesis, but I think at this point it's equally possible. What speaks against the second hypothesis is that the TREM2 polymorphism that's associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease is a decrease in TREM2 function. However, TREM2 function in itself is not quite clear. And it's not quite clear whether it activates appropriately or inappropriately the immune system or the innate immune system in microglia. So um, it's one of those many questions that are unfortunately not black and white, and we don't know, I think, in the field, we don't know how the immune system is involved in Alzheimer's disease, but I think it's safe to say that it has a major role, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I want to preface this with a very naive question. 
And I haven't spent as much time thinking about this as you have, but I have a puzzle to throw back at you after listening to your very eloquent talk. And that is, could it be that these plaques that we see um, and the buildup, and also because you showed that there are, are uh, important functions of these uh, gamma secretase and other proteins in synaptic development, that it's just that the machinery that sends these proteins to the right place or breaks them down correctly is broken in Alzheimer's disease rather than really the A-beta doing something, meaning that the plaques are there now because either the messages or signals that send them to the right place or break them down to lysosomes or whatever, that machinery is broken. Yeah, of course. So uh, that hypothesis is perfectly reasonable, and that was actually the idea that led to the antibody development, because the idea here is that for some reason these plaques are accumulating, and because these plaques accumulate, it's bad for the patients, and if we get rid of the plaques, the patients would be doing better. They are doing better, but if you totally eliminate the plaques, you don't stop the disease, suggesting that the plaques themselves cannot be the sole or not even the major drivers of the disease, because if they were, then you would at least level off the disease, okay? And you don't. But not just the plaques, meaning the plaques occur because that machinery is no longer there. Okay, so you mean there's some other, some other so factor. that the disease is actually due to a, uh, an impairment in the machinery. Again, that is possible. But then that wouldn't explain why the genetic hits are in the proteins, affecting the proteins of the plaques, and you know, that doesn't explain that one. So um, it's possible, yes. Okay, thank you. I, um, I'm gonna go ahead and thank you for being here. I feel like the direction of these conversations could go uh, in a lot of different numbers of, of discourse tonight. Um, I just wanna take the opportunity to, to thank you, Dr. Sudoff, for, for coming, and we are thrilled that you were able to be here to accept the Reverend Karrion Bettel. Um, and we appreciate all the time that you spent with our faculty and students and with all of you tonight. Uh, more importantly, we are grateful for the remarkable contributions you've made to the field and the profound and lasting impact you will have on our understanding of the brain and on ultimately improving human health. Uh, my name is Allison Slava. I just want to thank you again for being here, for joining us in the celebration of science. Um, I work with Dean Schnell in the College of Science, and he was elated to bring this award to fruition last year. Um, and again, we're just grateful for your, for your insights, your contribution, your enthusiasm, and we invite you to now to join us for reception uh, in honor of Dr. Sudoff. Thank you very much. Thank you.